torrential rains leave hundreds without homes in East New Britain. Former ombudsman urges government to make information accessible. And villages celebrate opening of health centre. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening, this is Saturday's News. Thanks for your company. Over 300 men, women and children are homeless after torrential rains and heavy flooding in East New Britain washed away their homes. Since Monday this week, the heavy downpour cut off road access between Kokopo, Rabaul and the North Coast Road. After six days of continuous rains, the East New Britain province has experienced widespread flooding, landslips causing roadblocks and homes washed away. According to the Catholic Diocese of Rabaul, 35 homes in the Rabaul district have been destroyed with a number of schools suspending classes as of Wednesday this week. Families who were affected have taken refuge at the nearby St. Joseph Parish at Malaguna Village No. 3. According to the National Weather Service, the continued rains experienced in East New Britain is because of a rare tropical storm, Wootip, which is occurring north of the equator. The National Weather Service warns that this tropical cyclone will see more rains and strong winds experienced, mainly in the Northern and New Guinea Islands regions. Meanwhile, the Rabaul district is expected to conduct an assessment on the level of damage the district has suffered. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Former Police Commissioner, Ombudsman and Senior Statesman Sir Ila Geno says public office must be accessible by the public. Sir Ila says many departments do not provide information for the public to use and often information is paid by those in need. The former police chief says public information is for all and keeping a tight lip about government records only raises more questions. Speaking to MTV News, the former police commissioner says most public information is now being kept secret. He says public servants must be transparent and must be open to the public for dialogue. He says people should not be paying for information or services provided by the state. I was advocating that there must be freedom of speech. There must be information, what do you call information, freedom of information act to be enacted so that people can freely have access to public information for the interest. On a related issue, Sir Ila is calling for a support to the role of media. He described the media as the third tier government or the eye of the public in keeping the government on its toes. They are by practice fourth arm of democracy to make sure with press and with news report hoping that this three formal arm of government will work honestly to the benefit of the public at large. Sir Ila has now retired from the public service. He says the country is going through one of the most challenging economic trends baffled by social and climate effects. He says all must work together for the better. The, all the government departments in the state in the day ought to be, they ought to cooperate with the public media and anybody who is seeking that information to assess his rights and their exceptions. Jack Lapave, Jr. National MTV News. Only the police commissioner has the powers to discipline members of the constabulary who act out of their duty statement. Former police chief Sir Ila Geno says comments made by members of the parliament to arrest and lay charges on disciplinary forces who damage the parliament must be withdrawn. Sir Ila says by law, prosecuting policemen will only depend on the investigation by the internal affairs. Requirement of the section 196, 197, and 198 of the cons of the constitution. Nobody outside of the police force shall direct the commissioner or any of the police members for the day-to-day -day operation of the police force and and also prosecution. It is entirely up to the commissioner of police to decide. 
Church, government, schools and families have the responsibility to ensure that the identity of the community and the online network responsibility are respected. This was the message highlighted today at the Media Education Seminar hosted by the Catholic Bishops' Conference Social Communications Commission. Moving on, the Papua New Guinea Defence Force Training Depot at Goldie River has a new commanding officer. He is Lieutenant Colonel James Kadizeni, a recent graduate from the Air Force Command and Staff College in China. Kadizeni takes over from former outing commanding officer Lieutenant Colonel Solomon Craig. Craig was serving as the commanding officer at Goldie when PNGDF conducted numerous trainings in the lead up to the 2018 Apex security operation. A parade was staged to signify the change in command and comes a week after another change in command at the 2nd Royal Pacific Islands Regiment in Wewak. Communities in a small village in Kainantu will now access health services at their doorstep. This follows the completion and opening of Jaffa Community Health Post recently. ADB Country Director David Hill says the ordinary people must have access to health facilities given the hardship faced in transportation and other expenses. The Jaffa Community Health Post is the 22nd health post to be built in the country. The infrastructure is funded through the partnership between Asian Development Bank and the government of PNG. About 10,000 people will have access to this held post. Small things like keeping the facility clean or safe are important. Remember, this is your health facility. Please get your annual health checks, talk to your health staff, and bring your babies here to get immunized. In addition to improve the rural health infrastructure network, the project has also supported the training of more than 300 health workers. This is to support the development of national standards on rural health services and maternal and reproductive health. This will see a developed digital health information system. According to health experts, this will collect real-time health service data for disease surveillance. Training district health staff in key clinical and strategic health uh, management skills and conducting community awareness activities on public health issues. For the local MP, taking ownership and proper management of the infrastructure is crucial. The kind of MP urges people to play their role in making sure primary health care services are not disturbed by social or other factors. Big blood challenge, will I give you play the last place, lawyer? Please look out in this place or something, we all come give me play. Sampla haplo papa nukini o lokisim. Yumi jafana, yumi kanantu, yumi laki lokisim. Oka pakisim pinis. Jack Lopave Jr. National MTV News. The production of soft drinks and labeling that copies those produced by a major drink company has caused concerns for members of the public. A foreign-owned company has been producing drinks that closely resemble the popular Sprite, Fanta and Coke color schemes produced by Coca-Cola. The drinks are also labeled PNG made and are being sold in shops around Lay City. When MTV contacted Coca-Cola for a comment, a company representative said the company was aware of it and had reported the matter to their head office. Yo, it's our today's news still to come. A tropical cyclone Oma downgraded in far north Queensland and Vatican holds summit to discuss sexual abuse by Catholic leaders. Details after the break. Welcome back to our earlier story. Church, government, schools and families have the responsibility to ensure that the identity of the community and the online network responsibility are respected. This was the message highlighted today at the Media Education Seminar hosted by the Catholic Bishops' Conference Social Communications Commission. Since the introduction of the internet, technology has brought about mass production and distribution of content. Students from seven schools in NTD attended the first media education seminar highlighting the importance of the role of the media and ways on how they can utilize social media to bring about awareness for the community. Coordinating the first seminar today, Father Ambrose told participating students that the need to communicate a message that is relevant requires that they know and understand what the media is able to do. We are trying to make them aware that they need to be critical about what comes across to them in the media. One. Two, that each of them need 
needs to be creative as they put content out into the media, especially the social media. And we take our cue from the world communication, the message. With the aim to enable young creative minds understand the media and contribute creatively to it, participating students from different schools gave a brief on how the seminar has helped to broaden their horizons on the role of the media in society. And we've learned like to use to use media, to use social networking sites and stuff in like in a positive way, not the negative way. We can <coughs> develop the different types of media skills and also to communicate and interact well with the other schools as well. Things that we actually learned here, they gave me so much experience and gave me confidence in anything I can do and to explore what, what I can do outside in the developing countries. The program is highly recommended for schools in NCD that would like to be part of the seminar in 2019, focusing mainly on mainstream media, writing news stories, photography, posters with a message as well as audio and visual basics. Our students who are growing uh, so that they too can be aware of what is happening, they too can contribute to the media and the media in turn will bring about a change in community and in society. Anit Kora, National NTV News. In Australia, Cyclone Omar has been downgraded to a subtropical low off the coast of Queensland. People on the Gold Coast have been warned to stay away from beaches with abnormally high tides. Dangerous surf and damaging winds expected to continue. Intensified overnight, it is anticipated that she will de-intensify through the day, become a tropical low and be denamed. Lifeguards have closed Gold Coast beaches until at least tomorrow with a severe weather warning in place for damaging winds, abnormally high tides and dangerous surf. There's also the possibility of public nuisance charges for anyone entering the water. The Gold Coast Mayor Tom Tate says some people aren't staying away. Surf life saving and lifeguard has been uh, doing it on a, a gentle basis and, um, and that's been adhered to. But if they don't listen, and uh, we'll be getting uh, the police to, uh, involved. They had to go in there and, and uh, tell them, you know, it's probably a good time to have a shower instead of uh, having a surf. So uh, they're winning that bit, but it's just amazing that uh, people are taking their life in their own hands. But it's a different story for serious surfers with waves of up to eight metres expected today. This week's conditions have attracted big names from all over the world, including Mick Fanning, Joel Parkinson and John John Florence, drawing crowds to headlands along the coast to watch their heroics in the huge swells. While those long barrels at Kira Beach this morning kept surfers and surfing fans delighted, there are now concerns that on the Gold Coast hinterland, Oma's strong winds pose an increased fire danger. Catholic bishops gathered in the Vatican for a conference on sexual abuse have been debating the theme of accountability. On the second day of Pope Francis' gathering of Catholic leaders, the talks focused on how church leaders must acknowledge the decades of their own cover-ups and secrecy had worsened for sex abuse crisis. Church leaders, bishops from around the world from more than a hundred countries and leaders of religious orders have been here on days two of this historic summit speaking about how they can in a sense police one another when there are issues of child protection at play, when there are allegations against bishops. We heard uh, from some of the organisers of this conference today who said that it's vital that there are a global set of reforms on the issue of accountability even in countries where where perhaps there haven't been uh, child sexual abuse scandals like we've seen in Australia, they've said there must be measures put in place uh, so that the Vatican can deal with allegations and that people can be properly sanctioned. Archbishop of Brisbane, Mark Coleridge, is here representing Australia. He's bringing with him uh, decades of experience dealing with these issues in Australia. One of his frustrations is that bishops are answerable often only to the Holy See, so thousands of kilometres away. When they've got an issue in their diocese, they have to wait for the Vatican's approval to deal with some of these cases. He says obviously there are vast reforms happening in Australia since the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. But Arch 
Archbishop College's concern is that regional bishops really shouldn't be policing one another. He says that's an issue of Caesar judging Caesar. Instead, he's proposed some reforms at the Vatican. He says it's just a suggestion, just an idea that's being tossed around in that meeting uh, behind us at the Vatican. It's an, it's an idea really to have a new, uh, a more powerful body and agency to deal with child sexual abuse allegations against priests and brothers, bishops, cardinals even. And this would be one agency rather than many different agencies at the Vatican dealing with this. Let's have a listen to what he said today. I think you can make quite a good case for some kind of new agency here in, in the Vatican, which would gather up all the various elements uh, in play at the moment in the field of child protection. Um, instead of having them scattered here and there in the various agencies, I think you could make a good argument to say it would make sense practically to bring them all together uh, into a single agency that, that would, be, would deal not just with child protection but with the larger challenge of integrity in the church. Now, structures are only structures, so you would need to appoint the right people to leadership positions within that new structure. We have to recognise that this is almost close to 200 people from very different parts of the world in the room. Uh, some come from countries like ours where we've faced up to the um, horrible consequences of clergy sexual abuse in Australia. Other nations haven't yet um, put this on their agenda, so to speak. Even Archbishop Coleridge today says he was surprised that some cardinals say this isn't a priority for them in their countries. They're dealing with uh, other issues of concern, war and famine and poverty and um, child exploitation in other ways. Venezuela Live Aid, a concert organized by Sir Richard Branson, has been held in Colombia just a few hundred meters from Venezuela. President Nicolas Maduro closed the border to stop much-needed aid supplies from entering the country. Meanwhile, two people were shot dead at the Venezuelan border with Brazil after confronting military officers. Live Aid for Venezuela. Under the South American sun, a benefit concert in Colombia for a nation in need. All taking place within sight and sound of the border crossing. And among the crowds, we found Venezuelans forced to flee the crisis in their country. I've been here in Colombia for 10 months, this man says, and I'm hoping that today will be the start of a new chapter for Venezuela. There are so many difficulties, Margarita tells me. Our brothers and sisters are dying at hospital doors because there's no medicine. They die at home because there's no food. They search for scraps in the bins outside restaurants. Venezuela's embattled leader, Nicolas Maduro, hopes to drown out his critics with a concert of his own nearby. But for now at least, spirits have been lifted. Backstage, Richard Branson told me this is the most important concert he's ever arranged. He's hoping the Venezuelan soldiers nearby are listening. We are hopeful that um, they will lay down their arms and accept um, white roses, which they will be handed, and, 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 and allow supplies across. Um, so, but if that doesn't work, we will continue with uh, more concerts and we'll keep the pressure on until finally humanitarian aid is let into Venezuela. But this was the scene at the border with Brazil today. Venezuela's military out in force to block any aid getting through. The stage is set for confrontation here tomorrow. Up ahead, the bridge is blocked. President Maduro says his troops must keep the aid out. The opposition says they'll be bringing it through. You're with the news on MTV. We'll take a look at more stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. In New Zealand, Auckland's biosecurity response remains in full swing after the discovery of a fruit fly in just over a week. But getting the do's and don'ts out in multicultural communities is also bringing with it challenges. 
Spreading the word about a pest which could put fresh produce like this at risk. Thank you. Two Fasciellus fruit flies were found in Otara this week, the latest found two days ago, 70 metres from the first. The species is native to Tonga. Two other Queensland fruit flies have also been found in Auckland since last Thursday. Biosecurity response teams using the famous Otara market as an opportunity to educate. And because this is such a multicultural community, the Ministry for Primary Industries have people here who can speak a range of languages, including Hindi, Mandarin, Cantonese, Samoan and Tongan. Brochures available in a range of languages. It's good, it's getting out there, the word's getting out there. But some people are still confused. I don't really know too much about it. There are still some people with questions. Local MP Jenny Salisa hoping she can deliver answers. What we're trying to do here in Ōtara is to make sure that it doesn't go out of this restricted area. I've gone around the schools, talked talk to the principals, the teachers. I'm, I'm also going around the churches. But this leader of Auckland's Tongan community says MPI should do more to stop flies getting here. It's always cheaper and always better to keep informing and reminding people about the responsibility of bringing stuff to safeguard New Zealand. What we're doing now is uh, uh, ambulance under the, uh, the cliff. He used to run a government-funded education campaign teaching Pacifica people about food safety and biosecurity. The initiative dropped around 10 years ago. And I was told that uh, it's not a priority. Hopeful the ministry will bring it back. For now, teams in the field are pushing on with traps and flyers, hoping there are no more fruit flies to be found. A much-loved Christchurch building in New Zealand has finally reopened today, eight years and a day since it was damaged in the February earthquake. The Christchurch Town Hall has undergone a $167 million rebuild and locals couldn't wait to get a gl first glimpse. A welcome back to this much-missed Christchurch building. I've been so looking forward to coming back and hear the loss of a concert venue. I mean, it seems so silly to cry about it, doesn't it? But it's just so amazing. People so excited, they queued from nine this morning to make sure they didn't miss out. Well, I was here really early because I love the town hall and it's part, been part of my life. The ribbon cutting, including the original designer, Sir Miles Warren. We the Christchurch Town Hall officially reopened. Yeah. And the 90-year-old architect shook hands with everyone as they arrived. It really does look exactly as it was. It has been beautifully restored. The acoustics of the town hall put it in the top 10 venues in the world. It's been a very important room in the world of acoustics because it showed for the first time the possibility of having a very full reverberation and clarity. What's beneath the feet of these crowds is just as extraordinary. The town hall's been strengthened to 100% of the new earthquake code. Former Christchurch resident Nolene Wall came all the way from Tauranga to see it again. It was like coming home. A sentiment echoed as people explored all of their favourite corners of the building that's been out of bounds since 2011. It's wonderful, it's lovely to have it back, such a great auditorium. Simone Pierce loving it so much. She couldn't resist an opening day dance. Still in New Zealand, one of the main attractions of this year's Wings Over Wairarapa Air Show was grounded, disappointing diehard fans, but there was plenty of military aircrafts in the sky to wow the crowds for the event's 20th anniversary. An Air Force workhorse treating the crowds in the Wairarapa today. And the Royal New Zealand Navy with a spot of dressage for helicopters. The military opening the show with a mock chase, going after this helicopter thief. 
It's the 20th year of Wings Over Wairarapa, featuring combat planes from the First World War. We have huge respect for those young guys. Those poor kids uh, were, were young and experienced. They had to fly in all sorts of weather and they were at war. The delicate, fabric-winged planes require a lot of care. It's uh, very special in that it's one of our originals, um, so it's an original airframe and more importantly probably an original engine that's uh, simply 100 years old. The 100-year-old fighters, Brits against Germans. One of the main draw cards, the US Air Force's B-52 Strato Fortress failed to show, grounded by mechanical problems. It would have been the first time the 65-year-old bomber had ever flown in New Zealand airspace. They're not able to get it back up. We've exhausted every possibility, but we're deeply disappointed. We know the organisers and, of course, the people who came here today are disappointed as well. Bit of a letdown, really, but probably the Australians just couldn't fix it. You haven't heard the sound for 100 years. That's stunning. So, enjoying the whole whole proceedings to this point. Have you liked the aeroplanes? Yeah. Yeah? What noise does a plane make? A fine day for flying and putting on a show. The Australian government is investigating claims that a New Zealand man was able to bribe his way out of being deported. William Betham is living free on the Gold Coast after being released in 2017, despite spending 10 years in prison and offshore detention for his role in a drug trafficking syndicate. William Betham, a New Zealander convicted of major drug crimes in Australia, jailed for 10 years, now living free in Queensland. He was facing deportation, but while in immigration detention on Christmas Island, allegedly boasted to another detainee. You pay $80,000 to a uh, certain person in Brisbane. Uh, that particular person has a good connection with Peter Durham's office, and I'll be able to get a visa within a couple of months. Peter Dutton is the Home Affairs Minister. He's labelled the allegations entirely false and says whistleblower Nauru's Anise has committed tens of criminal offences. But Anise says Betham's not alone. There's another guy who I'm aware of who did the same thing in Korea. Under Australian law, foreign citizens automatically have their visas cancelled if they're jailed for at least 12 months for serious crimes. But according to local media, hundreds have appealed and been spared deportation. The government this week confirming they're looking into whether their system is vulnerable to bribery. Is the department investigating the, um, the allegations um, that are contained in that article, which, that a particular person which in said short are the that um, for a payment of um, eighty thousand yes. um, dollars, yes. you can get your, yes. you can get out of detention and yes. into circulation. Yes, you're investigating those yes. claims. All right. Betham's lawyer says he denies paying anyone who could have helped reinstate his visa, and he denies bragging about it. She says rather it was submissions made on his behalf that have allowed him to remain in Australia, a free man. Up next in Chukai Sports, SB Hunters launched the 2019 season. Details after, after the break. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The SPP and G Hunters launched their 2019 season yesterday in the presence of sponsors, the media and valid partners. The team also launched their new home and away playing kits and announced the captain and vice captain for this season. This year will mark their sixth season in the Queensland Indra Super Cup competition. The team has a majority of debutants with only eight players from last season, part of the 31 players rostered for the season. But the debutants have proven their worth, earning a spot in the final squad. The competition between the 31 players and the way they've trained, and the way they've conducted themselves, and the way they've presented themselves has made it very, very hard for us not to end up with 31 players. Dashing new home and away jerseys, modelled by each player.
sponsors and those present having a glimpse of the new players putting name to face as anticipation grows to see these players take on the field next weekend. The highlight of the night, naming of the captain. The captain for the SPN team 2019 is Majesty Alex Hunter's most experienced and capped player, 100 games for the club and more than 50 tries. Hands down the perfect choice. His vice for this year will be Moses Meninga, equally impressive in the forwards. Queensland Rugby League has seen the Hunters pull crowds and entertain the masses for five seasons and is glad the Hunters have signed on for four more seasons. As the Hunters continued participation is important on many fronts, their involvement provides a pathway for emerging PNG players to fulfill their potential and their unique style and flair is a major draw card for our competition in terms of crowd support and our media and our digital footprint. PNG RFL proud that the Hunters have been a pathway for players to extend their careers overseas and continue to showcase PNG's indigenous rugby league talent. The Hunters program was to provide a sustained pathway for our kids to make it through the rugby league dream, for them to play in Tari, Vanimo or Buka, knowing that they could go and play in France, England and Australia. And we've delivered on the pathway with 27 boys over the last six years making it through. It's these talented players that the Hunters mold into professional rugby league talent that keeps the crowds entertained and make for exciting rugby league in the Queensland-based competition. That's what SB Hunters and Papua New Guinea brings to the competition. It's nothing else by that, it's just the fact that they bring people, they bring excitement, they do the whole thing. Fidelis Sukina, National MTV Sports. Versatile back Adek Swera has been appointed to lead the SPPNG Hunters this season. Swera has played more games than anyone in the 2019 squad and has more experience in the Intra Super Cup, making him the most suitable candidate to lead the team. Adex Wera is the only player that remains from the inaugural 2014 SP Hunter squad. Having played 100 games and scoring more than 50 tries since 2014 has added more credibility to his appointment as captain. Wera was speechless when told of his appointment by coach Michael Morrow. I'm a great, I'm a soak, I'm a blackout. You know, at one point I didn't come, but I'm stop going, I'm nothing. I mean, I just come up on them uh, confident. Block, prop, and second row. They have a reliable Moses Meninga. No relation to Mal Meninga. Moses Meninga was selected to be this year's vice captain, whereas says he's excited at this new challenge and looking forward to working closely with Meninga to lead the team this season. Moses came inside long 2017 season. Me play start play one time, so uh, me believe uh, experience play for uh, past two years plus uh, experience for me for past four years. I me like and uh, work one time to lead more young blood boys so all come up. With a large number of new players into this year's side, this is a fairly new team. Many of these players are young and possess a lot of skill and agility and bring new ideas to the team. I want something coach trying to put him come across low, understanding low, uh, team and all sub through all pick him up area, or like uh, all execute him one something coach I like him, him so uh, look him blow me I'm a young master to play along on them. The team is ready for the 2019 season. They play their first match on Sunday the 10th of March against Tweedhead Seagulls in Brisbane. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Trukai Sports continues with cricket, netball and rugby league after the break. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. To cricket abroad, the New Zealand White Ferns have blown the chance to upset Australia in the opening game of the Rose Bowl one-day cricket series. They look to be cruising in Perth only to get the stagger.
Breaking down a first Rose Bowl series in 20 years, it wasn't the strongest of starts for the White Ferns. Wrapped on the pad, big appeal here. No help from the opening stars Sophie Devine and Susie Bates, taken within 10 runs of each other and leaving the Kiwis 2 for 18. But getting their 242 run chase back on track was captain Amy Satterthwaite. It's beautifully heat. Satterthwaite bringing hope back to her side, managing to build a 45 run partnership with wicketkeeper Katie Martin. Nice shot. Martin soon falling for 20 and Katie Perkins would get the harsh wake up to the series. Face full of ball. The wake up they needed though, bringing the White Ferns back within striking distance. Whacked away, all the way. Satith Waite and Perkins needing 54 runs off the final 53 balls. The Kiwis on the cusp of a rare victory. Catch it! Oh, there you go! But the 99 run stand was brought to an end by spearhead Jess Jonathan. The Aussie continuing the blows. Satith Waite gives herself room, inside out, caught. The skipper taken just short of a ton. Victory still in sight though. Seven runs off two balls and New Zealand would have their win. Australia wins a tight opening clash. Pretty disappointing to I guess get so close and not be able to get over the line but on the other hand great that it was a you know a good game. The White Ferns quest to win back the Rose Bowl resumes tomorrow with their first of two must-win games. To netball in New Zealand, Central Pulse are hoping to rid themselves of any lingering baggage as the new netball season begins tomorrow. In last year's Premiership final, the Pulse had the title in their grasp only to lose. Bring on 2019 and some new talent. Teammates, teammates and on the way to being surf mates. I got up on my first go, which is pretty good, so I'm loving it now, but um, this one... <laughs> I can't even stand up Work on this... progress! <laughs> I can't even stand up on the stand-up pedalboard. Ellie Temu may be struggling to stand up on the board, but the defender's managing just fine on court. <laughs> Along with mid-quarter Maddie Gordon, the 19-year-olds are getting used to their new day jobs as the Pulse's latest recruits. Finally making it, I think for us it was both dreams come true, as cliche as that sounds. They both attended Mount Albert Grammar in Auckland before moving south to play for Central in last year's National League. We moved in straight away as well together. We were living in single beds right next to each other for a couple months. I got in trouble a couple of times for passing to Ellie too much and that's obviously how well we know each other. Neither play was involved in last year's grand final, where the Pulse snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. It gets brought up and some of the girls are like, oh my god, don't talk about it. Like, <laughs> but they'll be hoping to play their part in avoiding a similar fate this season. With seven silver ferns in this year's Pulse squad, getting hold of a starting bib will be a tough challenge for both Maddie and Ellie, but one they're both looking forward to. Knowing that the people in front of you are silver ferns, so that's just amazing. That's so surreal for both yeah. of us. Like, like, when we get the chance to go on court, we're obviously going to give it everything. And why wouldn't they, as they get ready to ride their first Premiership season? And to NRL, Warriors are taking confidence from a 12-6 pre-season win over the Melbourne Storm in Geelong, Victoria. Meanwhile, former Warrior Lewis Brown has opened up about the personal tragedy that rocked his NRL career before retiring last season. A new passion has helped Brown overcome the most difficult chapter of his life. With life after footy, this is Lewis Brown, the 15 test Kiwi with almost 200 NRL caps, now rolling into the world of fashion with his own brand. You've definitely been a fashion week, bro. <laughs> and helping Kiwi rap group Swit It prepare to open tonight's sold out 660 concert in Auckland. I used to rock up to like functions with wearing stuff and I'd just be like, what are you wearing? Even Ivan Clare would be like, mate, what are you doing wearing a cardigan? Over a 10 year career, the Christchurch born utility he could do it all. Here's Lewis Brown back on the test seat. He's going to score. But a single phone call from his sister after the 2016 Four Nations final changed everything. And she said, Oh, it's dad. Dad, something's happened to dad. And I was like, What? And she's like, Oh, he's, he's taking his own life. Brown hadn't spoken to his dad in eight years. Raised by his single mother, this is the only photo of father and son. People were coming up to me at the funeral saying, you look so much like your daddy, he was so proud of you. And he just didn't want to reach out to you because he's seen you happy, didn't want to be a burden on you. He battled with the loss in secret before channeling the emotion into his new passion. Earl's collection, a tribute to the middle name he shares with his father, a name now being worn by sports stars across the country. How proud do you think he would be to see you make this transition? Yeah, um, 
yeah, I hope he's pretty proud, eh? It was, um, yeah, it's a bit of a tough time, but, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm moving on with his legacy with me, so, yeah. A legacy set to continue, with sales taking off in just the first three weeks. And that ends Chukai Sports, the weather details for the next 24 hours when we return. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. With the forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, fine although partly cloudy in Port Moresby, fine weather in Daru, fine although partly cloudy in Kerama and cloudy with some showers in Alotau and Popundita. In the Mamasa region, cloudy periods in Leh, showers in Wewak, showers and thunderstorms in Vanimo, fine weather although cloudy in Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, partly cloudy with a shower or two in Loringau, becoming cloudy with a shower or two in Caving and Buka, and mostly fine, although partly cloudy in Kokopo and Rabaul. And in the Highlands region, fine weather, although partly cloudy with afternoon to evening showers developing all across the region in Mount Hagen, Groka, Kondiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. Forecast for small ships, there is renewal strong wind warning for all coastal waters, strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of Yule Island to Hood Point, to all Milne Bay Islands including Medang, Bogia, Wewak, Aitape, Northern PNG Indonesian border, Manus and New Ireland, also Bismarck Coral Seas and Pacific Ocean. Strong northwest winds of 25 to 34 knots are expected to ease for the next 6 to 12 hours, causing no further rough seas and high sea waves. All small crafts and boats are advised to take necessary precautions before and after going out to sea. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that has been the new sport and weather for today, Saturday 23rd of February 2019. Enjoy tonight's viewing. Also, a reminder, MTV's reality TV series, Green Angels, is on again at 9.30pm tonight. Tune in for that. Have a pleasant evening. Take care. Good night.